Today I'm talking to Isanne Lewis and it's an exciting time for her because she's actually been on television and they sought her out because of uh, the birth charts that she does for babies. So it was this morning and um, got a huge uh, volume of uh, uh, people watching that programme. So Isanne, uh, how did it go? Did it phase you? Hello Carla. Uh, definitely leading up to it. Definitely. I'm obviously very nervous. And I think they say when you do public speaking or you're acting, it's good to have that bit of adrenaline. There's something wrong, you know, if you don't. So, yes. But when it happened on that morning, I was quite prepared. And the camera crew, the techie people really helped me through it, the initial stages. And I just went into, it, it felt somewhat surreal. I felt kind of outside of myself a little bit. Um, it's almost like watching myself and we only had seven and a half minutes, which is long, but also short. And I had to cover baby's charts as well, questions they had. So they gave you information in advance. You had to do some charts in advance and that's very time consuming, isn't it? A lot of it planning. Is. It is. They asked me to do, um, I think, eight baby's charts. And I knew in seven and a half minutes with the intro, they probably weren't going to get through it all. But the mothers had a specific question about their child. And I think I had to give about 40 or 50 seconds to each one. And luckily that's something I can do. It's not ideal because every moment in time a birth chart contains, I think it's about 2000 um, signatures, variables in it. And one has to synthesize the whole picture of the chart and give an interpretation but I hope I did my best with that. And I certainly got interest after the programme. Well, that's really good. Now, in normal circumstances, a, a birth chart, uh, it, it would be for a newborn, maybe as, as a gift for a, for a newborn. And therefore you're working on a child that hasn't got uh, anything that has happened to them. But you, you are giving an insight into what they're likely to be like and what their future is likely to be like for them. It's not fortune telling. You actually made that very, very clear in the interview, didn't you? Because that's a common thing people ask you. This is true. Nothing is cast in stone. And we do have free will, and I know we can abuse free will, but we often, perhaps more so, we neglect it. So when, when you're faced with uh, doing a birth chart, you, you want as much information as, as possible. So what do you ask of people uh, so that you can actually do a chart? And maybe you've got a chart that you can show us. I have indeed. And I ask for, it's like putting code coordinates into a sat nav or GPS in a way. You're getting your direction. And I'm asking for the full date of birth, including the year. Uh, the time on the clock when the baby's born and the town, which is a longitude and latitude, but I work that out, of birth. And this is one chart, um, this baby born today, so I think it's 11.30. And you can see how the planets are around the circle and the angles between the planets, the the strengths and weaknesses, the flows, the link with the family line, the areas of life which are going to be significant or more significant than others for the child. And if I put this chart up, um, as a toddler now, or more toddler, you see how the different. distribution, the distribution is different. Yes. So although so, so although you 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 will do a chart for a newborn uh, as on mm -hmm. the program uh, they they actually uh, gave you the task of uh, two brothers and uh, so, so that was a case of looking at their uh, the time that they were born but what what they were like or what they are like today um, so that is 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 quite different then so. Just to give um, our viewers an, an idea of the sort of work that's involved in, in, in those charts then. So I calculate the chart. In the first 15 years of my career, going back to 1979, there wasn't a programme, there wasn't computers for a while, but also not a programme for astrology. And oh, I didn't have it anyway, or know how to have it. And so I did all the mathematics 
for that place, longitude, latitude, time of birth, date of birth, by hand, the logarithms and so forth. When these programs came along, and nowadays I calculate that information onto the computer like I've just shown you, but the interpretation again is my own, is my own. And I'm looking at all the different ingredients. It's like what goes into a cake, if I may use that analogy, all the different things you put in to make it. And it's a very complex cake, there's lots in it. So in a way you've got to pull all that information together. When I'm doing a chart, of a baby or perhaps a child, a young adult up to 17, 18. At that point, I feel they can talk to me. But to say under the age of 17, the parents usually want to know about educational choices, any crisis points, perhaps they're experiencing one, a little bit about health. I'm not a medical astrologer, but you can see uh, some of the energies um, if they're weaker and areas of diet, which would help. And how they fit in with the family line, the relationship with the father line, the mother line. And one example is the moon. Now the moon changes sign, one of the 12 zodiac signs, every two and a half days. And the moon sign is very much for inner world, how you respond emotionally. Are you a quick reactor, are you not? And also with the first years of life and the matriarchal line of the family, which obviously covers grandmothers and so forth going back. And that can be really helpful. And you often see a very strong link with the moon sign of a child's chart with signatures, as I call them, planets, dominant ones in the parents' charts. And that can be really helpful to understand how they interact and communicate. So do people actually come to you more than once? So they might come to you when a child is uh, just born, but they might come to you later on, uh, later on just to get uh, more information or when they're facing some sort of milestone in their life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that applies quite a lot to education, which is so vital, isn't it? How we're educated. And for example, if a child is a more visual thinker, likes to reflect and is being pushed very academically and analytical kind of education, left hemisphere brain one, this can be rather, if not damaging, but worrying for the child and can bring up issues. The planet Mercury very much links with our communication, learning ability, how we adapt and rules the years, particularly from seven to 14. So the sign of the zodiac that Mercury is in how it's aspected to other planets in the chart, are they easy or not, can tell us a lot about the best kind of education. And is the child more of a late developer? Nothing wrong with that or an early one and may slow down a bit later. And I think all those things can be really, really helpful. So turning points where you can see in a chart where planets overhead are aspecting quite strongly to the child's birth chart can indicate not just turning points, but perhaps crises. Not so much external ones, but internal ones. And to know when it's good to take a little rest. Maybe that child needs more rest for a while, more creative activity instead of pushing the schoolwork. That's not always possible, I know, but it does help to be aware of that. And the parents can really help in that respect. So in many ways, I see the child's chart very much like a toolbox. It sounds rather a pedantic word, but it is a useful tool that the parent can dip into and listen back to, have listen got, back to at certain times. Have you got any particular examples of this, just to give us an illustration of what it's been like, mm. maybe a particular chart that you remember where you could see exactly what a child was like, even before their parents knew what they were going to be like, and it all, all came to pass? And it all came to pass. Well, as we said a little while ago, it isn't fortune telling, nothing is cast in stone. And the expression nature or nurture plays a part, conditioning not just at school, but at home and in the social life of the child can make a huge difference to how they choose to live their life. And I always compare it to um, actors in a play and maybe one of them gets stage fright and won't come on and let somebody else play that part for them. And when that child is young, they're criticized, or perhaps they overdo something and then feel really guilty, 
with a part of their nature, maybe it's anger or something else, then they kind of shelve that part. And that can become a problem down the line. So I have seen charts where that is the case, or it's interesting how when a child is bullied, why or where does that happen? And I often find that children who are, if we call it victims of bullying, are often powerhouses. There's a lot of power in the child, but they don't feel comfortable with it. So they project that power, they disempower themselves by in a way handing it over to somebody else who takes it out on them. So I've worked with parents quite a bit about understanding that child is quite powerful and how they can empower themselves, perhaps to love themselves better, to feel proud of their abilities, to be able to say no in particular, and then the problem starts to go away. Schools are trying to stamp it out, but they, they can't get on top of it all the time. And it leads a lasting effect, effect into adulthood and, and workplace as well, because people are bullied in the workplace too. So this is essential really to know what your traits are, mm. how you can, can deal with it. So do you also get um, people that have been bullied in the workplace coming to you? Yes, I do, Carla. And sometimes they say, well, maybe I'm just going to leave my job. And that old expression, you take yourself with you wherever you go. <laughs> yes, it's like wanting to move house or move to another town or even into another relationship. It's so important to understand the dynamics at work at the time. And sometimes it is the right thing to move away, particularly in a work situation. And of course, as adults, we've got the free will more to do that. As children, we are kind of caught up in our school system and obviously with our families it's not so easy and again it comes down to that person who is the bully is often quite a weak individual not very happy with himself and sometimes by being able to say to the bully why are you so unhappy you have to behave like that or I don't deserve that something quite simple and not even being afraid of perhaps losing the job because you've said it Again, it's an energy thing, it, you know, it changes the dynamic. So change also I found dynamic important. Uh, early on, you said that part of uh, the, the process is examining uh, the parents, uh, what, what, what they are. Now, a lot of uh, young people uh, go through uh, the trauma of uh, a divorce, uh, you know, their parents divorcing. And uh, this has a big impact on young people in junior school, but also in senior school. So how can you help uh, people that are going through divorce? Again, this is a little bit beside astrology, but I think when parents actually start blaming one another and telling the child how bad <clears throat> the other parent is, this is incredibly damaging because children want to see their parents as adults, as a role model. And when, parents can actually recognize and know that they've actually had this child and therefore there's been love and there's been some good things with the marriage. And to be able to explain that to the child and to know that they will still be there for them gives that child a greater sense of security. So that's in a way aside from astrology. And I can look back at maybe when the child has come back to me as an adult later on. Yes, that's and what I was thinking. And then says this happened you can see there was some kind of eruption i mean it's difficult to explain how i see it in the chart it's like a signature there and you think oh what was going on then was there some sort of split or <clears throat> moving home or or the like and um yes and i think sometimes that puts it into perspective even in adulthood to understand that perhaps that was the right time because the unlived life of the parent, what isn't talked about, what is whispered or not mentioned, the child will always pick up subliminally. Now, uh, we've gone through a, a pandemic uh, where children have not had the schooling that uh, they were used to. They've been schooled at home and parents are very mm. worried about them going back to school, but also those who are choosing career paths and may not have had uh, the right tuition in, in, in the run up to it. So you're being sought out at the moment for this, aren't you? I am, Carla. People are very anxious. Recently, I've done readings for two 17 year old girls and looking at direction. 
And I always immediately would look at their child and how much support they're getting from their parents, separated or not, and their peer pressure around them. Sometimes it gives them the opportunity to perhaps take stock of where they really want to go. Do they really want to do university? Do they prefer an apprenticeship of some kind or some work experience? Maybe university later. I mentioned earlier that some children are late developers. They haven't all got to go from A-levels into university immediately. And I think that gives them an opportunity during this lockdown to really address what they want to do. But of course, it is very damaging as well. There's a lot of anxiety. We could call this the time of anxiety more than usual. Now, yes, and do anxiety, sorry, there's a lot of anxiety, but also there's a lot of uh, demands on children who are trying to live up to their parents' expectations, maybe doing something that their parents want them to do rather than what they're actually more suited to doing. So do, do you find that quite a lot? I do, and this applies not just in lockdown, but generally, where trying to live up to a parent, and again, one can see that in the chart, the influence of the parents. Um, does one see one's mother as a, as a critic, um, as a nurturer? Does one see one's father as somewhat distant or a benevolent kind of teacher figure? There's many, many ways of seeing the parents and, of course, siblings and teachers. So living up to a parent's goals is very prevalent. I don't know how much it is now compared to how it was when I grew up. But what I do see in the birth chart, Carla, is the authenticity, if you like, of the soul underneath all the layers of conditioning. Because if the birth chart is a snapshot of that moment in time where the planets are, then that energy, if you like, that blueprint is there within the child. But genetics come in, conditioning, education. And to fit into life, we have to sometimes adapt and to people please. So my job, if you like, is to look at what's beneath all those layers, to pull them all back and to have an honest discussion with the parent or the perhaps a young person later on when they get to 17 or 18. In all courageous honesty, is this what they want to be doing or what they really want for their child? And with parents having a blueprint of that child with the talents, it gives them an opportunity to perhaps steer the child into certain studies or certain hobbies anyway, which will amplify those abilities. Now, uh, today, uh, the day of uh, this interview, uh, we're, we've got the spring uh, equinox, uh, the birth of new beginnings. Uh, so it's a good time to actually talk about this very chart. So what can you say, you know, when, when, when you're coming out of a very dark period and the, you've got the birth of something else. So what are you seeing in the charts at the moment? Charts at the moment. I think spring in our northern hemisphere anyway, it's obviously autumn in the south. The spring period is very much about rebirth, renaissance. It's equinox means equal night or equal day and night. So it's about the balance point in the year. The polarity of that is the autumn equinox, again, the balance point of the year. And this period when the spring tides, if you like, the tides within us and outside are rising and nature is blossoming. It's very important for us to get very, very centered. It's not unusual for fluctuations, extremes of tiredness and hyperactivity leading up to today, the 20th and the days leading on. And it's been shown in research, I believe it was at Yale University in the neuroanatomy department, where at the equinox, there's measurable permutations of the nervous system, the blood changes. You remember that old saying, a grandmother said, the blood changes at the spring equinox. And whether that's strictly true or not, definitely the nervous system goes, undergoes changes. And what is so vital is to be centered at this time. And of course, it's quite hard at the moment being that way. Wherever we turn, we put the news on. You know, we just heard there's a spike of, of um, cases in Europe. And you think, oh, here we go again. And it kind of knocks us off centre. It makes us wobble. So I believe the beauty of the equinox, and I do something which may sound a little strange, but just at the time of the equinox, which was 9.37 this morning, I just tune into nature. 
and I offer myself and my skills to the coming season and ask for it to support me in the, these coming three months. And I've done that for quite a few years now. And I can sometimes really feel that connection because when you make an intention at the beginning of something, it's like a springboard. It's like a springboard. An intention is so important. And the start of anything, it's like a race or diving into a swimming pool, it's got to be just right. So that moment of birth, seizing that moment, seize the day, by resonating with it, connecting with it, you actually are in tune better with your own rhythms, but also with the nature rhythms. And don't forget that our bodies are from nature, even though our souls, I believe, are from elsewhere. So we really need to honor these inner timekeepers. And the more we connect with nature to really experience it and its changes, and even to look up and see that beautiful canopy above us and feel that connection, we can't really feel alone. And maybe that's an important thing to know at this rather uncertain, still, time period. Well, uh, I mean, that is a, a great insight. And just before we go uh, for uh, today, um, for the people that are skeptical about how, you know, how can the planets have anything to do with what happens to our daily life? What's your response to that? Gosh. I will smile at that question because if we were able to really prove how it works, somebody would be a multi, multi-billionaire. It's one of the oldest subjects in, in the world and people have been working with it, cooperating with it, navigating with the planets and stars since man first and man woman first walked on Earth. And I always say the proof of the pudding's in the eating. And when people have said to me, oh, it's a load of rubbish or something, I'll say quietly, well, you go away and study it. And then, and I studied it for a few years, then we'll have an informed discussion. Okay. Um, it, it really, or well, most of my work, Carl, it comes from recommendation, referral, nearly all. And it's because it works for that person. It's helpful. Like I said, it's like a toolbox. And we do know that the moon affects us very much. We can't dispute that. We've got a full moon coming up on the 28th of March. That's the next one. We have a full moon once a month and we know it resonates with the tides and also with our own fluids. It's interesting that our fluid level is higher at a full moon. And I believe it's Weight Watchers who once said that um, at a full moon when you're weighed, you're actually a tiny bit heavier. It must be minuscule, but you are. And hemorrhaging is greater then. The sap in these big trees they cut down, like the redwoods, are more prolific at a full moon. So to this day, to this day, the, the trees which are cut down for wood are marked with the phase of the moon. And the more expensive wood is at the new moon, when the fluid level is lower than the full moon, when the sap has been devastating the wood more, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, here's a, another amazing fact. And the fact that scientists have looked into this this subject and uh and you've been you've been dealing with this for a number of years uh so it is it it is something really to contemplate to to check out and to enjoy your knowledge so thank you for giving us the benefit of that today and uh, i trust television will seek you out again because it was this morning that you were on which is a a big uh, daytime program in the uk and I suspect that there will be more television programmes coming after you uh, in the near future. So, Izan, thank you so much for today. And thank you, Carla.